why other theory became such a bone of contention in the war is explained by its location as the place where the main stem of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad crosses the Potomac River on its 300 miles of track, terminating at Wheeling. A secondary reason is the fact that by 1861, the lower town along the riverfronts was occupied by a maze of buildings used by the federal government to manufacture rifles and munitions. An activity that as the war developed caused the location to become a depot of military supplies the Union armies could draw upon in their invasions of the Shenandoah Valley. A process that began with Pennsylvania Militia General Robert Patterson in 1861 and ended with Sheraton's conquest of it in 1864. But these facts alone do not explain the strategic reasons that account for its garrison being attacked by Confederate forces in the course of operations one year and not attacked the next. The history of these operations begins in May 1861, when the state government of Virginia sent a force of his militia under the command of Colonel Thomas J. Jackson to occupy the place. During the several weeks he commanded the small Confederate force gathered there, Jackson began the construction of what is now called the Stone Fort on the summit of Elks Ridge, and a similar structure on long nights. As an artillerist, Jackson recognized the reality that the lower town where the Arsenal complex was located, as well as the upper town known as Camp Hill, would be within range of artillery placed in the heights of the two mountains, making the idea of holding the place against an infantry force large enough to storm Boulder Heights the ridge three quarters of a mile west of Camp Hill, untenable. In late May, General Joseph E. Johnston appeared at Harper's Ferry and, in taking command of the garrison, placed Jackson in command of a brigade composed of Virginians, which Jackson would take to the Battle of Bull Run, and it would earn the name Stonewall Brigade in his action on Henry Hill. Within weeks of his arrival at the ferry, Jackson came to the conclusion that not only was the location undefensible because of the problem of the mountains looming over it, but the Confederate force was in the wrong place. Patterson, with a force of Pennsylvanians, was concentrated at Williamsport, 30 miles to the west to move toward Winchester. In June, therefore, with the approval of the Confederate War Department, and after removing the arsenal machinery and military supplies, and destroying the old covered railroad bridge, Jackson marched two of the three brigades his command formed up the valley to Bunker Hill to be on the flank of Patterson when he moved toward Winchester. And as these brigades marched, Jackson sent Jacksons to Martinsburg to destroy the machine shops and rolling stock of the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad located there. A few weeks thereafter, with fence and maneuvering between Johnson and Patterson resulting in stalemate, Jackson slipped his force away to Manassas and joined Beauregard's army in time to effect a stinging defeat on Lincoln's new army under the command of Irvin McDowell. Ten months now passed with the federal government in possession of the ferry. During this time, with the design of a B&O engineer named Bowman, an iron truss bridge was constructed on the old stone piers of the covered bridge that Jackson had destroyed. And Colonel Dixon Miles of the old army was placed in command 
of a force of infantry, artillery, and cavalry with his headquarters at the ferry to guard the railroad tracks and the bridges, trestles, and culverts that cross between that place and Wheeling. Then came the spring of 1862, and with Lincoln's reconstituted army about to pound on the gates of Richmond, Stonewall, commanding now an army composed of three divisions amounting to 17,000 men, routed Banks and Winchester, and following him to the Potomac of Williamsport with one division, where were the other two, Winders and Ewells to Harper's Ferry. The reason Jackson did this had nothing to do with the idea of seizing possession of the place. For on May 26, when he began to move from Winchester, he knew that Lincoln had reacted to his advance down the valley as General Lee had expected him to by countermanding his order releasing McDowell's Corps of three divisions to march to Richmond and ordering McDowell instead to march two of his divisions, Shields and Ords, to the valley, with the third, Kings, marching to Washington, while John Friedman, with a command of 25,000, was ordered to march from the Appalachian Range to Harrisonburg. Lincoln's idea being to box Jackson in his retreat up the valley between Friedman and McDowell and destroy him. Jackson's sole purpose in appearing in force in front of Harper's Ferry was to keep alive in Lincoln's mind the fear that the enemy was moving with the intent of forcing the passage of the Potomac at that point and marching for Washington. In this atmosphere of confusion, fear, and alarm, Lincoln was persuaded that Colonel Dixon Miles could not be trusted with the mission of defending the ferry against the mighty Stonewall. So Lincoln seized upon the circumstance that another regular soldier recently appointed a Brigadier General of Volunteers, Captain Rufus Saxton, was available to take command from Dixon. Saxton was a Massachusetts man, a Republican and an abolitionist, who Lincoln had a week earlier appointed military governor of South Carolina. Saxton had departed Washington for his new assignment on board a steamer, but it sank in a storm, and he had returned to Washington. Saxton reached the ferry on May 26th, as Stonewall was marching to Winchester with two brigades of infantry and 300 sailors to serve three naval cannon they brought with them. Giving Miles the title of Chief of Staff, Saxton had the three guns, two nine-inch Dahlgren shell guns, and one 50-pounder pair of rifle gun, placed in battery on a shelf of ground at an elevation of 600 feet on the west slope of Elk Ridge. The 50-pounder positioned to command the crown of Loudon Knights, the middle gun to cover Camp Hill, and the remaining gun, the right shoulder of Bolivar Heights. The tube of a dog and gun weighs some 3,000 pounds. It seats carriage another 2,000 pounds. It fires a 90 pound shell, depending on elevation, about one and one quarter miles. To serve the gun requires a team of 10 men, each with a duty to perform. Once fired, the tube must be reamed and sponged with water to eliminate embers still burning from the explosion of the powder charge. Then mop dry. Then a new powder charge rammed in, followed by a shell with the gunner piercing the powder bag at the vent, sighting the gun on the target, 
while men with staves move the gun left or right in his direction and then wheel the monster into battery. A process that with this gun, depending upon the skill of the team, could take five minutes to complete. On May 28, when Jackson was advanced into Winder, appeared in front of Boulevard Heights, Jackson held the original skirmishers, placed one of his two brigades with two batteries of artillery on Camp Hill, and placed a second brigade on Elk Ridge in support of the 300 sailors serving the three naval guns in battery. On May 29, with Ewell's division arriving at Halltown in support of Winder, Jackson sent the 2nd Virginia Infantry Regiment across the Shenandoah River at Kelly's Ford to occupy Loudoun Heights and the Stonewall Brigade of Winder's Division deployed his skirmishers and went forward to engage Saxon's men firing at them from Boulevard Heights. On May 30, couriers coming and going, bringing news of the progress of the enemy. McDowell was at the Manassas Gap, approaching Front Royal and Fremont, having marched from Franklin through the Appalachian Passes, was passing Moorfield. Jackson and Winder continue through the day with his demonstration. The next morning, May 31, Jackson ordered a retreat to begin, leaving Winder with the Stonewall Brigade and two batteries of artillery to hold Saxon in check. During the night of the 31st, as a rainstorm swept over the region, Winder called back his skirmishers and began marching his brigade toward Strasburg. The situation for Jackson's army on the 31st was now critical. For Shields' division, the McDowell score had driven the 12th Georgia Regiment out of Front Royal, but 12 miles from cutting into Jackson's retreat at Strasburg. While Fremont was approaching that place from the west, some 10 miles or so off, and Banks and Williamsport was gathering himself to pursue but the head of the seven mile long column of Jackson's army reached Strasburg early on the morning of June 1 and threw up earthworks on both sides of the pike while the balance of the army passed that place during the day. With Fremont's advance appearing to the west late in the day and shields in sight to the east but hesitating to attack, finally the Stonewall Brigade appeared having marched some 48 miles from the ferry. It passed Strasburg as the clamp was closing, and by nightfall, Jackson's army was at Woodstock. 